61A Lecture 35 Q&A. Except that today I forgot to record the Q&A, so I'm going to do my best to remember some of the questions that people asked and answer them here. It turns out that this was a pretty short Q&A anyway, so hopefully you didn't miss much. We didn't go over any exam problems or anything like that. We just talked about recent uh, lecture content. So here we go. The first question was, what's a tail call? How does that relate to a tail context? Well, a tail call is a call expression. If you have just like a number literal, like 12, then that's never a tail call. You have to call a procedure. And what's a tail context? Is, is it always the last thing? And what does it mean by the last thing that gets evaluated? Well, it's more specific than just being the last thing that gets evaluated. It's really that it's the thing that you evaluate in order to get the return value of the whole procedure that you're currently calling. So, you know, if this were Python and we actually had return statements, then basically you'd know you're in a tail context if you had the return keyword right there. And that expression was a call expression where the result of that call expression was going to be what you were returning from the current function that you're in. And after that, we talked a little bit about map. So let's look at this map example. Here it is. Uh, map checks to see if S is null. Um, the predicate position, the first position in an if, is never a tail context because you're always going to have to evaluate either this or this afterwards. So um, the only things that could be tail contexts are here and here. And they are, as long as this whole thing is in a tail context, which it is, because it's the only thing in the whole procedure. So null s is not in a tail context, but it's not calling map anyway, so it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, this is. This whole cons expression is in a tail context, but the map within it is not. Now, this is an interesting case because after you evaluate the call to map, you've like done a bunch of work. You actually don't need the current environment for this original call to map in order to do any more evaluation. You've already evaluated cons. You've already evaluated the result of calling procedure. You've already evaluated map. Really, the only thing left to do is apply the cons procedure to the results, the arguments that you get from these two. So you don't really need the environment, but you do need to remember that you were about to cons and that you have this procedure that you're consing with. So you have some like information associated with this call to map that is more than just the information you get from returning from this call to map. There's like more work to do still after you call map from within map, and therefore it is not a tail call. So the rest of the slide looks like this. Um, it says this whole thing is a tail context and so is this, but this part is not. Although we came up with a way of rewriting map such that all of the recursive calls were in tail contexts. And it turns out that's possible, but only with some amount of reversing. And by the way, there's another way to do this, which is to perform mutation in order to build up the result. But we haven't talked about mutation in scheme. It's part of the language, but just not part of this course. And so, um, you know, you could work out how to make map tail recursive in that way too. The second question was about the code.cs61a.org SQL interpreter. How do you get it to display tables that you define? So for example, if you're working on the homework and you want to see what this table looks like, if you paste it in here, then you don't see the table. Well, create table doesn't really output anything. It just assigns the name parents to some new table. You would have to select star from parents in order to see the whole table. Okay, another question was about when you would ever join three tables together, where you join a table with some other table and then back with itself. And uh, it turns out that when you join a table with itself and another table versus joining a table with another table and back to itself, that's the same thing. The order in which you join tables doesn't matter. I mean, it matters a little bit in that if you select star from the result, you'll see values in the table order that you join them in. But you're not going to get different rows at the end of the day. You're not going to get different contents, regardless of what order you join things in. So we went back and looked at this example from lecture. This is from lecture 32. That was the second SQL lecture. And here was a case where it made sense to join a table with itself and some other table. 
And I, I think this is the standard way in which you see a three-way join where some table is there twice and then some other table is there once. Is that you're trying to relate two different attributes for two different entities in some table, like the dog's table. In this case, we're trying to relate their fur together, make sure their fur is equal. But you're also trying to express some other relation that requires a join. So the other relation here is that you want um, not just to find two dogs with the same fur, but two dogs with the same fur and the names of those dogs are related to each other. One is the grandparent of the other. But you can't just look at a name from dogs and another name from dogs and know that they're grandparent, grandchild. You have to join in information from another table in order to get that. So some other table tells you what all the grandparent pairs are and um, there you end up with a three-way join in order to go from dog's name to grandpup's name to grand dog's name to dog's name. And now you know that the name of this dog and this name of this dog are referring to two dogs that have this grand dog, grand pup relationship. Now, in a three-way join, it's not always the case that you want their characteristics to be the same. Here we have, they have the same fur. But you could also say, like, you know, what are all the fur pairs? You know, the fur of one dog and the fur of the other dog, where one's a grand dog and one's a grand pup, you'd still need a three-way join for that. Even if you didn't have the fur in the where condition, but instead showed up in select somewhere. So in the Q&A, we were talking about, you know, how would you write an expression of what kind of shoes one professor has and what kind of shoes another professor have, but you only care about pairs of professors that are teaching the same course. You might get the same kind of relationship. Just like the dog's table tells you about the fur of the dogs, there might be a professor's table that tells you about what kind of shoes they wear. And then, instead of a grandparent's table telling you who's grand dog, grand pup, you could have some table that tells you, oh, here's pairs of professors that are teaching the same course. And you'd end up with a three-way join, too. The next question was about the order of operations within a SQL statement. Um, particularly, does the where happen first, or does the having clause happen first? And the answer, surprisingly, is it depends what's in those clauses, I think. So here's a city's table. Oh, that's hard to read. Here's a city's table from lecture where you have a latitude, longitude, and name of the city. So there are all the rows. You might think, you know, if you write something like, I want the name from cities where latitude is greater than 38 in order to get the cold cities, that what happens is that you know, first you get all the rows, and then you filter them, and then you get their names. Then there's some order here, like from comes first, and then where, and then select. It turns out this is not the case. If I wrote something like select name, and I want to know if they're cold or not, so I create a column for that. And I select that from cities, and then I write a where clause. I'm fine to refer to the cold in the result. So it turns out that you might compute these values before you filter by them. And that's just how SQL works, is that the SQL query engine figures out which parts need to be evaluated first in order to evaluate later parts later. That's kind of one of the interesting characteristics of database management systems. So, you know, we don't write our own query engine in this course because they're pretty complicated. When you take a database course, you could learn about how to do that. But then there's this kind of question of does where select input rows or output rows? And the answer is it kind of depends on what you put in there. Okay, so those are actually all the questions that I remember from Q&A today. Hani also made a very nice comment about how he hopes that you all have a nice, relaxing Thanksgiving break and get recharged in order to finish out the semester, which I think is a great thing. I'm sorry you couldn't hear him say it because I failed to record it, but... Um, we both really hope that uh, you get some rest this week after you finish the scheme project. Maybe find some pumpkin pie and enjoy the rest. And we will pick this up again next week because there's no lecture on Wednesday or Friday.